Very well behaved. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's very special event here at CEPR with Ronnie Chatterjee, who is the acting deputy director of the White House National Economic Council. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and it's really great to have you with us here today. I'm grateful for your support that fuels our research and our support of students and also helps us bring uh, speakers of Ronnie's caliber to CEPR. We are only 18 days away from our annual uh, economic summit on Friday, March 3rd, and I'm hoping to see many, most all of you uh, there to spend the day with us. It's going to be, I think, a real standout in the summit's almost 20 year history, and I'm excited that we're gonna have Condoleezza Rice kicking things off with the breakfast keynote, many interesting sessions throughout the day on a broad set of topics, and then Wrapping things up, last but certainly not least, will be Larry Summers as the uh, dinner keynote, talking about looking backwards and forwards on economic policy. And our panels at the summit on US-China relations, the economic impact of changing demographics, the future of the tech sector, along with the impact of technology on the broader labor market, and the role that economic is playing in energy and environmental policy couldn't be timelier. So if you haven't already RSVP'd, I hope you will soon. And please let me or anyone on the staff know if you need more information about the summit. And as much as I'm looking forward to that event, I'm also really, really happy to have my former colleague, Ronnie Chatterjee, with us here today. He and I worked together uh, about 13 years ago on President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. Um, and I was constantly impressed by his infectious energy, positivity, and seemingly limitless knowledge about innovation and the broader economy. Ronnie was tapped by the Biden administration to spearhead the implementation of the CHIPS Act, which I just learned a couple hours ago stands for creating helpful incentives to produce semiconductors. Is that, that's, that's true. Were you sitting around in a room like, okay. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so this act is set to pump billions of dollars into the US semiconductor industry to ensure greater domestic production of computer chips. Uh, Ronnie is at the forefront of uh, what this important policy means for national security, for supply chains, and of course for the US business and economic landscapes. And he's really the perfect example of the type of speaker whom we strive to host at CEPA, someone working directly on the front lines of economic policy implementation who has a deep appreciation for the academic research and the scholarship that help guide the decisions being made by government officials and by industry leaders. Along with serving as the National Economic Council's acting deputy director, Aaron Rani Ch Chatterjee was appointed to be the chief economist of the Department of Commerce in April 2021, just shortly after President Biden's inauguration. That role made him the principal economic advisor to Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimundo, whom many of us have seen speak here at CEPR just a few years ago when she was governor of Rhode Island, and responsible for developing policy related to US competitiveness, labor markets, supply chains, innovation, entrepreneurship, and economic growth. And as I mentioned a minute ago, Ronnie also previously worked in the Biden administration, serving as the senior economist, as a senior economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors. He is currently on leave from his position as the Mark Burgess and Lisa Benson Burgess Think Distinguished Professor of Business and Public Policy at Duke University's Duke Fuqua, I'm sorry, I, yeah, the Fuqua uh, School of Business. He has also served as a team member of the Council on Foreign Relations and worked as a financial analyst at Goldman Sachs between his undergraduate studies at Cornell and graduate school at the UC Berkeley Haas School of Business from which he received his PhD. After Ronnie's presentation, I'll ask him a few questions, have a little bit of a conversation, then I'll open it up for questions from the audience. So please be thinking about what you would like to ask him. And with that, please join me in welcoming Ronnie Chatterjee to CEPR. Thanks, Ronnie. Thank you so much, yeah. I appreciate it. Well, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay with this? All right, well, it's great to be here. I do have some slides, but um, I will start just by thanking Mark Duggan. Um, when I joined the Council of Economic Advisors as a senior economist, uh, it was a time of transition. I had joined in, I think it was March of, 20, uh, March of 2010, 
and some of the economists who had been there since the beginning of the Obama years and worked through the financial crisis, the American Rescue Plan, they were on their way out to go back to academia. And Mark was one of them. He was going to leave that summer of 2010, as I remember correctly. And what was scary for me is we need to backfill Mark's position before we got the next real health economist, who would be a woman we both know named Helen Levy. So Christy Romer, who was my professor here at Berkeley, or not here, I'm sorry, here in the Bay Area. Yeah, I know you guys are sensitive about that. Yeah, I was at Berkeley, right? But um, here in the Bay Area at Berkeley, Christy called me in the office and said, you know, you've done some research on medical devices and healthcare. When Mark leaves, can you stand in as a health economist for the summer? And uh, stepping into Mark Duggan's shoes when it comes to health economics is very, very difficult. It was the time we were implementing the Affordable Care Act, and there were lots of high stakes and important meetings. But I just remember Mark sitting with me really patiently, explaining, me, explaining to me the infrastructure of how a health system works, all the key issues, all the things I need to watch. And I always want to say thank you for that, because you, you definitely, I mean, you know, I did not know much going in, and Mark prepared me to do a great job for President Obama. And uh, I was happy to hand that off to Helen, but I really appreciate all the work that you've done. And um, I also want to say a few people in the audience, you know, who I know, Kathy Eisenhart and Chuck Easley, Kathy Shaw, and also my intern from the White House, Ethan Tiao, is here too. So a lot of familiar faces. As I was talking to folks in the beginning, I got this strange sense that there's a lot of people here who know a lot about the CHIPS Act and everything I'm doing at the White House, and there's a lot of people here who don't even know what CHIPS stands for, although they know now, okay? There's a lot of people who want to debate uh, US-China relations and geopolitics. There's a lot of people who want to go deep on you know, the future of the three nanometer node, and there's a lot of people who want to hear what I think about Intel, TSMC, and Samsung. So there's, there's like a lot of different things going on here. The good news is I'll try to touch on a high level and give you a sense of what I'm doing at the White House and why it matters. I'll explain what CHIPS is and where it fits in. I'll try to touch on some of those issues. I probably can be less interesting than I am usually as an academic because you know, all my talking points are approved by my employer, which is currently the White House. So I'll do my best to answer your questions the best I can. There are just some things I won't be able to talk about as, as in much detail. So I'll be more boring than usual. I also think, look, there are people in the audience who are going to be much deeper on some of these technical issues than me, so I'll try to admit where my limitations are. There'll be people who've thought about some of these issues from a different angle. So I'll give you the best I got on this stuff. But really what I want to do, my goal is for my part of the talk before I, I work with Mark here, to talk about what the CHIPS Act is, how it fits into the Biden economic strategy. So you just have an idea of at least how we think the theory of the case is unfolding. Talk about what's happened so far and some of the implementation opportunities and challenges I have as the coordinator for CHIPS. Does that sound like a good plan? And I'm sure there'll be some people who want to hear more. You can, you can ask in the Q&A or follow with me later, and I'll do the best I can. All right, cool. Let me, let me start off and uh, talk a little bit about this. So just in terms of history and why this is organized this way, when I joined the Commerce Department in April of 2021, is pretty much the beginning of the Biden administration. Secretary Raimondo, who had been the governor of Rhode Island, had just joined and been confirmed, I think it was in March. When I got to the Commerce Department, Mark and I, when we'd worked at the CEA, we didn't necessarily think of commerce as the stuff where all the new policy was driving through. You know, Treasury was really active during that period after the financial crisis. The difference in this administration is that the Commerce Department actually had a lot going on. And Secretary Raimondo was a former venture capitalist, a treasurer in Rhode Island managing their pension fund, and a governor, as you heard about in the previous CEPR event, was really ideally positioned to take over at this time. Commerce has, give or take, like a $14 billion budget per year. Um, it has everything from like the Census Bureau to the US Patent Office to the Economic Development Administration to NOAA, which deals with our oceans and climate. It's a very diverse organization. Some people call it like an undiversified or a diversified conglomerate when it comes to government. And one of the challenges was that they were going to be receiving a lot of money from the Biden administration agenda. Infrastructure funding, which later totaled about 40 to $50 billion to connect all Americans to broadband, and eventually the CHIPS Act, another $50 billion. This is an agency that had a $14 billion budget annually. So if you think about the changes from an organizational standpoint, so for folks who are in the business school here or think about organizations and institutions, a big change is needed to happen on the implementation side. And so working with Secretary Romano during that period was really exciting as an economist, but also someone who's grounded in the business school and thinks about organizations. You know, we'd have a lot of meetings thinking about internally what the Commerce Department would need to do to set up the infrastructure to run things like the CHIPS program that later happened. We'd also have meetings with CEOs who would talk to us about the business environment, what we need to do there. We'd also have meetings on things like technical standards or patent policy. It was a really diverse set of topics that was great for an economist like me. But it really, you know, maybe around the middle of my tenure, chips started to become a bigger and bigger issue. A semiconductor shortage was happening during 2021. And the interesting thing about shortages are, right, they can come from both demand and supply places. I tried to think about that in advising the secretary. 
And this shortage had real macroeconomic impacts. So if you think about 2021, inflation was a big concern then. And auto prices were about one third of inflation in 2021, core, okay, core. So why were auto prices going up? One of the reasons is we didn't have the chips. So if you go to visit a dealer lot and you'd look at all these cars out in the lot and you'd ask why they're not being sold, part of the reason was because they didn't have chips to go into the cars. It seems crazy. I had never worked on these supply chain issues at such a deep level before. I joke with Mark, if you would have asked us in the Obama administration who worked on supply chains, I don't think there was a person who just did supply chains. But with cars, used cars and new cars not being available because of this lack of chips, it became a huge economic issue. And now, you might not think chips are that important for a car, right? Now they have a lot of them in there, but it's everything from monitoring your tire pressure to controlling the airbag to much more sophisticated uses in the car, especially with electric vehicles coming online. So that kind of led us to really focus on what was causing these supply chain disruptions and whether the Chips and Science Act could be a solution to some of these challenges and the longer term issues around both national security and economic security issues around supply chains. And so the CHIPS Act really came out of some of those discussions. In August of 2022, the CHIPS and Science Act, and I'll talk a little bit about why it's and science in a second, it passed with bipartisan support. Uh, you might have heard this tale that Washington is hopelessly polarized, no one talks to each other, we all throw food at each other in between State of the Union addresses. But it was a bipartisan bill, as was the bipartisan infrastructure law. So Republicans and Democrats agree that CHIPS is really important, which gives sort of my job, I think, it makes it a lot easier, to be frank, because I can talk to lots of different kind of people about what I'm going to talk about today. And it passed um, overwhelmingly in August. President Biden, I think one of the core convictions he has from his experience as vice president, when Mark and I were serving with President Obama, is that implementation really matters. And he was actually the point person, vice president, then Vice President Biden, on the ARA, the, like the stimulus of the 2009 era. And so he appointed, for all of the major bills I'm going to talk about today, the American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act, he appointed implementation coordinators. And I became the implementation coordinator in August of 2022 for the Chips and Science Act. So my job, what I'm trying to set up here, is to make sure that all the agencies that got money from the Chips and Science Act execute on time, they deliver their notices of funding on time, and we implement the program in a way that is reflective of the Biden administration values. That's the role of the White House. I'm not the one who's deciding who gets the money. That's a group inside the Commerce Department that I help set up. I'm not the person who is going to decide all the legal technicalities of it. We have lots of people working on that. I'm the coordinator who gets all the people at the table and tries to figure out if we're doing things the right way. When there are policy disputes around different issues in the program, I'm the person who tries to solve them with a larger group. So that's my role at the White House, and that's kind of what I'll talk from today. Happy if people want to drill down on the Department of Defense or the Treasury Department or the National Science Foundation, talk a little bit more about what they're doing internally, but they're all constituents around the table for the steering work that I'm doing. So that's, that's the level set in terms of where we are and where I'm coming to you from. Let me show you a little bit about this. So one of the words that's been used a lot to describe our strategy is the modern American industrial strategy. My boss is Brian Deese. I report to the NEC director. He described it as such in one of the recent speeches he gave on this. Here's what a modern American industrial strategy does. It identifies areas where relying on private industry on its own will not mobilize the investment necessary to achieve our core economic and national security interests. So if you're an economist, you know I'm already going to be starting talking about externalities. But if you're just thinking about the history of Silicon Valley, you know, this actually isn't that hard of a sell in my personal view. Why do I say that? I mean, where did the integrated circuit actually come from? A lot of the work that was done early at Texas Instruments was a result of a demand push from the Department of Defense and the space program that needed chips to put a man on the moon. And it was actually the government that was a huge buyer of computer chips during the 1960s, bringing the price dramatically down, and eventually helping create the consumer market. So many different industries, and I mean, Silicon Valley is the perfect example of this. If you think about the defense contracts that really got the Valley started and all the entrepreneurship and innovation here, a lot of times in our history, we've taken these strategic sectors and we've made investments, investments against them. And that's really where sort of Brian and the rest of us have been sort of creating the theory of the case for chips and the other pieces of the agenda. Some of the reasons, and I think these are obvious if you've been looking at the economy recently, but the demand shocks from the pandemic and the supply issues were a big driver of why we started to think this way. During the pandemic, it wasn't just semiconductor chips. It was all sorts of different goods that people had taken for granted, PPE, that weren't showing up where they were supposed to be on time. And we started to realize that a lot of the global supply chain infrastructure we had set up over the last 25 or 30 years, while really great in some measures of efficiency, did not have enough slack and had created tremendous vulnerabilities for the United States, both in economics and national security. 
And so I think there was this mentality of thinking, well, we've been thinking all this time about just in time, but maybe we start to have to think a little bit more about just in case also. That's a big shift in thinking, and if you're an economist like me, it requires you to think through some of your first principles and, and what we're talking about here and how much Slack is worth and how to think about these supply chain disruptions you know, using first principles and economic models. But for a lot of folks, I mean, they had been worried about these supply chain disruptions for a long time and talking about vulnerabilities, um, particularly around geopolitics, as the concentration of chips is really in one part of the world. And when you think about, we used to produce maybe 34, 35% of all chips in the United States. We're down to 11 or 12% produced, manufactured here in the US. And of the most advanced chips, we don't produce any of them in the US. So, you know, one response to that is like, wow, you know, we've outsourced a lot of manufacturing. We're losing an edge that you get from the innovations that come from manufacturing. But we also do the design piece quite, you know, quite well. And you know the companies here in the design space. And they're the high value added, high margin part of the business. So for a lot of times, that sort of equilibrium held. But during the pandemic, I think people started to think about this a lot more. So these are some of the reasons we put together the industrial strategy in that frame. I won't talk too much about the other bills. I mean, they're, they're obviously, they're deep and interesting, but there are four parts of the industrial strategy, just to keep in mind. The American Rescue Plan was that first bill that was passed in March of 2021, often called the stimulus. Um, I'll talk about what we think of the impact there, but that was sort of setting the table for recovery. And the three bills after that, the Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act, really compose like, what we're doing in 2023, what we're gonna implement. Those are all the things that were passed in the first two years. And you know, I'll spare you the discussion about you know, all the back and forth and the drama. The fact is they were passing the law in 2022 and 2021. Infrastructure law isn't just roads, rails, and runways and the Secretary of Transportation. It's also broadband, it's also EV chargers, something important to remember. The Inflation Reduction Act is about lowering costs, but it has a lot of climate in it, right? So if you think about the investments, particularly the tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act, it's really an effort to make sure we develop the industries of the future um, and make sure that some of the industries that haven't been even created yet take off and we're able to do something around climate change and mitigation. And the Chips and Science Act is to build manufacturing capacity for chips, both leading edge and legacy nodes in the United States and fund the research and development for chips so we can be a leader for years to come. That's how we think about that one. Okay, so these are the four components of how I think about the, the industrial strategy. Oops, go the other way. These are just some quick line items on this. I'll focus more on the CHIPS Act. And in fact, just for time reasons, let me just talk about the CHIPS and Science Act. Okay, so one thing people often ask me is they say, look, I heard the CHIPS and Science Act is $300 billion. Where is the extra $250 billion? Where are you hiding it? It turns out that the money, the $300 billion that is cited in the press repeatedly, is a number that is authorized. For those of you who worked on science and tech policy, you'll know there's a familiar pattern where we authorize these large amounts and we work up to it, but the actual money that was appropriated, which means the money that the Commerce Department and the other agencies actually got, was $52.7 billion. So this 300 billion, sorry, not this 300 billion, but there's a 300 billion here behind this number that has not all been appropriated. So the key thing to remember is we have $53 billion. It is allocated around several government agencies. The Commerce Department has 50 billion of that money. So I'll tell you more about that in a second. Already since the CHIPS Act passed, we've seen over $300 billion in private sector investment uh, from companies like Intel, Samsung, Texas Instruments, TSMC. And we're expecting hundreds of thousands of well-paying jobs to be created. That's both construction and working in the fab and the supply chain piece of it, which will happen in semiconductors. So that's sort of the, the piece of the agenda that I'll spend most of my time talking about. Obviously happy if I can to address issues around the IRA and bill. That's not in my remit in terms of like what my day-to-day -day job is, but happy to try and draw the connections if, if useful. Here's a legislative history real quick, something called USICA, which you might remember passed in the Senate. There was a, a bunch of twists and turns as the Senate and House negotiated key differences. And in July 2022, they combined two things, the CHIPS Act and some science uh, provisions to create the CHIPS and Science Act with bipartisan majorities. Um, I was there August 2022, and the president uh, said, you know, today is a day for builders. And so for him, I think what really resonated is the idea of building back manufacturing in the US. For a lot of other folks, there's many other things in the CHIPS Act that they're looking forward to and want to benefit from, but that was really the theme of the event in August. Here's how the funds are distributed. Here's that top line number of the authorization of the 300 billion. The 52.7 billion is for our Chips for America funding. There's also a really important tax credit that the Treasury Department is working on right now. It's a 25% investment tax credit for qualified manufacturing investments. 
So for companies that are going to build fabs, these are the facilities that make semiconductors in the US, they could potentially take advantage of, if they are successful, applying for CHIPS money, and also avail themselves to a tax credit that would give them 25% credit on qualified manufacturing investments. That's a big deal. When people run the numbers, um, it's a significant amount. So the tax credit is part of the work I'm doing as implementation coordinator. Here's a couple of the different parts of the program. Commerce has 50 billion. It's split into two pieces. 39 billion is to fund the creation of the semiconductor fabs around the US. 11 billion is to fund research and development and more sort of future looking work on semiconductors. To tell you the truth, the research and development part is not that sexy. No one pays attention to it as much as the, the big money that's gonna use to build the facilities. People like tangible things, they wanna cut ribbons, they want to see the effect. As people in this room know though, R&D is gonna be fundamental. And creating that pipeline around innovation is gonna be fundamental to maintaining and extending our lead in semiconductors. So I think if I've made one contribution to this whole thing, it's really trying to keep the emphasis also on the R&D, which will be as important in many ways. Part of that R&D money, the 11 billion, will be used to set up a national semiconductor technology center. We haven't had a nationwide effort right now to set up a semiconductor research organization. We've had some history uh, around this with different efforts. Semitech will come to mind for many people. This is supposed to be something different, and the Commerce Department's in charge of this piece right now, and it's set up a separate office to work on the R&D piece. For the $39 billion, Commerce has a CHIPS program office we've stood up that is both writing the notices of funding that will go out over the course of this year. The first one will go out at the end of this month, which will basically lay out the criteria for how companies can apply for pieces of that money to build here in the United States. The Department of Defense has $2 billion to fund research and development with defense applications. All of our weapon systems rely on chips, too. And if you think about the kinds of chips that they rely on, it's much more legacy and older nodes than it is the new cutting edge. Really important to make sure that stuff's also secure and our supply chain is resilient. That's what the DOD effort is about. National Science Foundation has a relatively small number compared to the others, but it's important for training. $200 million to fund workforce development. I met some people earlier on who were interested in that. Happy to double click on that piece with, with Mark. And the State Department will have $500 million out of this money. That's how you get to the 52.7 to fund international efforts to make sure the ecosystem for semiconductor production is strong. A lot of people say, look, supply chain resilience, how are you gonna do all this stuff in America? You can't do all this stuff in America, right? Th th this is a complex global supply chain. I'll show you a picture in a second. So the State Department, one of their charges is to work with our partners and allies to make sure that they're making investments to build complementary infrastructure to help support this system, right? Diversifying the supply chain, making it more resilient. Those are the different pieces of the CHIPS and Science Act in terms of the actual money we have. Just to give you a sense of like where the applications are, okay? So CHIPS are really important, especially the legacy or trailing edge nodes. Um, they're gonna be really important for white goods like laundry machines and refrigerators. I mean, anything with an on and off switch now is gonna require a chip and your automobile will need a lot of them. If you look at some of these use cases in wireless and electric grid and automotives, they're all growing very fast in the next couple of years, in the next decade. Folks are projecting that the semiconductor industry is gonna be a trillion dollar industry by the end of the decade. So it seems like huge demand push from some of these sectors. It is a very cyclical industry, and Mark maybe will ask me some questions about that later, but it is true that the complexity of some of these goods, particularly cars and how they're changing, will require more and new kinds of chips, and that's something we're, we're tracking really closely. Um, if you think about um, on the business side, I mean, your PC, your laptop, the, or, uh, or your phone, this industry has generally tracked GDP in a lot of ways and consumer spending. And so when consumer spending is hot, like it was during the pandemic, people are buying lots of commuting equipment and there's a big demand for chips. When things slow down and people are buying less of that, there's less demand for chips. Some of these things might start to change the equation depending on where, where they develop and we're watching sort of supply and demand really closely on the chip side. Chip shortages in 2021 cost us about 240 billion. The automakers I mentioned, if a factory that packaged semiconductors in Malaysia was shut down for two weeks, it would slow down production in the United States of a Ford F-150 plant and lead them to furlough the workers there. That's how connected the supply chains are because that packaging plant in Malaysia is an important step in the production of semiconductors, so much so that the car company can't make the cars without them. And so you saw tons of lost value the automakers were basically looking for chips, trying to locate where they could get them. These are not the most sophisticated chips. These are chips above the 14 nanometers, let's say, 28 nanometer, 40 nanometer, that area. And the other thing to mention is, while we don't make many of the chips, downstream, US firms are the lion's share of demand. So even though we don't make them, we are among the, the biggest consumers. And that's an important thing to think about in the economics. How are we doing on time, Mark? How do I? Okay, good. <laughs> 
Okay, this is a chart I won't explain too much, but just to let you know that the supply chain is really complicated here. When we started in the Biden administration, I got a lot of questions about supply chains. Lumber prices were high. Someone said, how do we bring down lumber prices, okay? I can say now I've successfully brought down lumber prices, okay? I solved the semiconductor shortage, right? Everything's fixed. But of course, like, there were disruptions during the pandemic. Uh, there was a cold snap of weather in Texas that froze pipes, right, that led to petrochemical plants that make resin. That resin is a really important in, uh, input to um, OSB. Does anyone know what OSB is? Oriented strand board. It's like a substitute for plywood. So builders couldn't get OSB because they didn't have resin because the petrochemical plants had frozen pipes. And that led to an increase in the price of lumber, which people felt at Home Depot and among our builders. Those are the kinds of supply chain discussions we had a lot, whether it was ball bearings, aluminum, semiconductor chips, baby formula. This was pretty much my whole first year of the, Obama or the Biden administration. One thing I learned from this is that supply chains are really complicated, and the government really wasn't set up when we started to deal with supply chain disruptions. Why? Because, number one, like, look how complicated this is. Right? Most people don't come into government understanding the 17 different parts of a supply chain, particularly one that's global. Second thing, Mark and I talked about this in his office. Think about something like um, employment jobs or wages. We have better data in the government than you have on the outside, despite the tremendous advances by some of these labor market monitoring firms. We have better administrative data. Supply chains is the opposite by a long shot. The private sector has better data on supply chains than the public sector. And so that gap, both in terms of where the data lies and the capabilities to analyze it, is a huge issue if you're trying to think about supply chain policy and building more resilient supply chains in semiconductors or anywhere else. And that was a big challenge early on. The third thing I'll say is we're not organized right, to think supply chains. The data we have is at the individual level or the corporate level or the regional level, not the connections between firms. And so the government is right now trying to build up and figure out how to think about supply chains more strategically. Think about this other issue. Internationally, when you have a supply chain crisis, you need to be able to contact your partners and allies around the world. If you're dealing with a financial crisis, you know you should contact the finance ministry. Dealing with a healthcare crisis and a pandemic, health ministry. Supply chain? There is no supply chain ministry in the Netherlands or Japan or any of those places. There's no supply chain ministry here either. So the question is, how do you build institutions that connect our global partners around these issues? That's not trivial. I know it sounds like, oh, pick up the phone and call us. No, you have to figure out how to create dialogues, how to create summits, how to create mechanisms where people are keeping in touch, sharing data, and working to try to crack these kinds of problems when there's shortages in the system. That is a kind of foundation that's gonna take many, many years after I'm gone from government and require an investment across successive administrations. If you think about the institutions that we built up in the post-World War II era to shore up and support the economy that we built and really lay the foundation for global supply chains, if we're really gonna to move to an, area, or an era where we think about supply chains differently, where industrial strategy like this becomes more prominent, we're gonna to need to develop different institutions. Right, to support it, and I think supply chains is one of those areas, okay? This is sort of some of the 700 steps involved in going from a silicon wafer to a chip. People who are expert on this and work in the industry know that this is a simplification. So if you think about from the government side, I mean, someone says, okay, let's invest in shoring up the supply chain in key areas. I mean, where, how, what? That's, it's a very difficult proposition for people who don't necessarily have that background. So a lot of this does require or interaction with stakeholders, working with companies, trying to figure out where those gaps are, looking at data that we haven't looked at before. But you know, during the pandemic, there were lots of different theories about where the challenges in semiconductors were. Some people thought, look, it's all demand driven. We're just buying more PCs, we're buying more phones, we're at home during the pandemic, that's what is creating the shortage in semiconductors. Other people felt like there was a lack of key materials in the system, or that distributors um, had certain uh, types of chips and not others, and there was a matching problem. Lots of different theories, very difficult to come up with like rigorous answers that would satisfy Mark or even an Econ 1 professor, right? Very, very difficult given what we're doing, okay? A couple of things I think are really important. I mentioned this point about 13% of the output. You're not gonna see 100% of this made in America. That's, that's unrealistic, right? And not 100% of the value chain can be located in America. But building up our capacity to build more semiconductors, a greater share, is the goal of the chips and science side. Timing-wise, that's gonna take some time. It takes a couple years, really, to get a fab up and running. It takes a little bit longer to get the equipment in the fab, and it takes a little bit longer after that for the fab to get to full capacity. So these are challenges on a time scale that's longer than most political cycles. And if you're trying to think about, on the political economy side, how to explain to people what we're doing, you're gonna have to look for nearer term and uh, less tangible milestones sometimes to signify we're making progress. 
a factory opening, an investment being made, those things are happening. But in terms of actually producing the chips, even if we start now, it will take a while. And that's one important thing to remember. It makes the policy discussions more interesting, but more challenging. You're seeing some of that already, right? We've seen over $300 billion in private investment. If you're gonna pull off this kind of industrial strategy, you have to crowd in private investment. Everyone, the first thing everyone from industry tells me is, hey Ronnie, congratulations on this job. Did you know 52 billion is not enough? And I said, I get it, but it can never be enough, right? So we need private sector capital. And you're seeing that actually in a big way since CHIPS was announced. And that's interesting for the 300 billion. It's things like Intel saying $20 billion for two new factories in Arizona. Micron pledging $100 billion for a factory in New York. Micron, a different segment here, right, for folks who are in the industry, memory versus like leading edge logic. TSMC building in Arizona. The CHIPS Act, importantly, will help any firm that's building in the United States. So it's not limited to American firms. So if you're TSMC or Samsung or Global Foundries or Intel or Micron, you can benefit from CHIPS Act if you're building in the United States of America. Right? And if you look at what Micron's doing, right, their projection is 50,000 jobs. They're also creating community investment funds. This is a key that maybe I can talk more about Mark or people interested in it. We are really, one of the Biden administration values is these investments can be anchor investments for broader economic development. Many of these places that are getting investments are places that have not had sort of big employers on manufacturing for a long time. They used to have it a generation ago, and there's lots of opportunity to develop the surrounding area. There are different ways for these investments to unfold. If anchor investments are made, and there's not complementary investments in a community college, or housing, or other parts of the puzzle, not only will they not work, they will not create broader benefits. And so when you think about what you hear from Micron, Intel, TSMC, and others, they're thinking about this, we're thinking about this, it's something we take seriously. I can double click more on it in the Q&A. Here's Intel. One key thing I wanna say here about the Columbus facility, and this is, if you were listening to the State of the Union, the president, I got it like maybe 60 texts during the beginning of the State of the Union saying, and I was reading the transcript, and he was saying, um, they mentioned you, and I thought it was actually me, Ronnie Chatterjee. It was not me, but I did not make it into the speech. But, he did mention chips, and he talked about the field of dreams in Ohio. And if you hear the president talk about this for him, again, it's this, it's this idea of possibility. And so Licky County, Ohio, where this is being built, um, it's the first expansion Intel has made in 40 years. A lot of the jobs are gonna be in construction. So watching the construction piece through the chips act is gonna be really important. The jobs in the fab are less, but significant, thousands of jobs. These jobs, both on the construction of the fab, can be accessible to people who don't have a four-year college degree. And that's one interesting thing to watch. I think a lot of the promise of why a lot of a broad set of people are excited about the CHIPS Act, they feel like it's an opportunity, and, and I do too, to bring people who haven't had a chance to work in the tech industry, to work in manufacturing, into the fold. That's not gonna happen on its own. And we're thinking a lot about what kinds of training programs you need around the country in every place that has these anchor investments to create a pipeline and an on-ramp for people. Because we know if we don't do those things, in two or three years, all we're gonna have is a bunch of press releases and a bunch of you know, stories on a website that says these five people are exemplars, right? We're not gonna have sort of a rigorous evidence-based approach to workforce development. We're not gonna allow people at scale to have opportunities in this industry. You also, of course, need people with advanced degrees, training in STEM. You're gonna need people domestically and immigrants as well. But on this case, right, on the construction jobs and people working in the fabs, which includes things like HVAC, machine operators, there's a tremendous opportunity that we gotta work on. So that's something I focus a lot on. Intel has this big uh, uh, approach working with 80 colleges and universities, including the largest uh, and oldest uh, historically black college in, in Ohio. So that's some of the stuff they're doing over there, to give you an example. Just to say more broadly, this investment that we're seeing in chips is happening in a few key places in the country, Arizona, New York, Ohio, Texas, and there will be more. If you look at the broader map, this is from our friends elsewhere at the National Economic Council, biomanufacturing, clean energy, EV, and batteries, it's happening all over the country. And so we take a lot of pride in seeing these investments happen. It's a fun day when the president goes to announce this. It's a fun day when it's you know, another deal and I get to cut the ribbon. We're enjoying these things and hoping that it creates benefits. In my home state of North Carolina, there's a really interesting cluster of a silicon carbide semiconductor plant coming up next to an electric vehicle plant, next to a battery facility, all by different companies. That kind of cluster happening all around the United States could create a lot of benefits and a lot of great jobs. And that's the promise, I think, of a lot of the, the industrial strategies and the investments. I said a little bit about defense. I think that um, if you think about the chips in our satellites, and our stealth aircraft, our cruise missiles, it's gonna be key to the future of defense as well, not just existing technology. When you think about AI in this, in this way, too, the ability to basically um, use artificial intelligence in national defense and security is gonna be one of the key comparative advantages for any country. 
And we have a strong interest in making sure that the United States has superior advantages there. I probably can't say too much more about it, but like this is a key thing. And, and I would say, when you think about the bipartisan support, when I go talk to people about this, the national security angle looms very large for many people as the key reason that they're supportive of the CHIPS Act. Many economists who might otherwise be skeptical, for example, of some of the other pieces of the act, they see clear externality for national security. The idea that such an important component to our defense systems could be geographically concentrated in one place, even if it was efficient from our perspective, right, might not be something that, that is sort of how we want to go from a policy direction. So that's, that's one thing I think is kind of interesting. Um, I want to say a, a word about state. The State Department is doing the global piece of this. I get a lot of questions about this because people say, well, but what about our partners and allies? And it's very true that we're going to need a distributed system of global semiconductors. If you think about um, the cutting edge equipment, lithography, the EUV lithography, that's made, uh, the equipment for that is made by ASML, a country in the Netherlands. If you think about the substrates, the chemicals that go into the semiconductor uh, process, that's in places like Japan. It's distributed all across the world in some key places, and there are opportunities for other countries to participate and do things in packaging, let's say, which is a really important part of the semiconductor process. The State Department is making sure that we're identifying those opportunities in a strategic way and will help those partners and allies get those clusters started that will support a globally resilient industry. So that's what they're working on with this piece of it. Let me just give you the sense of like the timeline. We passed the law in August. I got to work on this in September. We will release our first notice of funding opportunity at the end of February. So it's coming up very soon. It's going to be a big event for us. Over the rest of the year, we're going to release applications for other parts of the value chain. You can think about this as the opportunity for manufacturers, right, to, to sort of build the leading edge fabs. And you can think about the other ones filling in the supply chain and other pieces of the equation throughout this year. The R&D money, we're also going to release information about that throughout 2023. So the time frame for the notice of funding is now, but there's going to be an application, there's going to be due diligence, and then there'll be funding announcements. So in terms of where's the money, where are my chips, right? This is the year that we're spelling out how we're going to allocate the money, and then we'll see applications. So look, we always want to move quicker, but these are going to be pretty complex deals, and this is the time frame that, that we're operating on right now. This is my last slide. So looking ahead, here are some things that I think are interesting. And this, I have to admit, when I wrote this slide, I was probably thinking more like a professor and not like a policy guy with talking points, because maybe these are questions that I can't really answer. Okay, all right, oh, Pandora's boxes I don't want to open. So will the pace of private investment continue? I'm really proud of the private investment we're seeing. Every week I'm seeing some new announcement uh, with a B behind it for billions of dollars around the country. They need to continue, otherwise that 52 billion will not be large enough. And the projects need to be completed. And that is a challenge that involves permitting and uh, environmental review. It is a process that means uh, if the industry, for example, is strong enough for those projects to make economic sense. So those are some things that are important to watch. And I think in terms of milestones to keep an eye on. Will the appropriate investments be made in workforce development? This is something I really take seriously because I think it will not work if we don't have the workforce. And people who are skeptical about our success of the CHIPS Act around the world, they often point to workforce as our Achilles heel. And that's something that I think we're going to need to work on in the government, but I also think we need help from the private sector, right? There's two, there's a lot of sort of comments about labor shortages and we don't have enough workers. We need more evidence-based solution for what works in training, and I'm happy to talk more with Mark about that. Supplier base is important. When a company, particularly from another country, locates in a new country, new area, their supplier base may be concentrated back home. How will that supplier base come to the U.S.? What are the incentives separate from the CHIPS Act that can help that happen? How quickly will that process happen? They won't be able to deliver otherwise. Will the pace of cluster development, what will that be? And when I talk to mayors, I've talked to the mayors of all these different places, a big part of my job, they actually tell me, look, the biggest thing is the housing. Where are people going to live? Now, I'm not the housing coordinator, right? So I don't necessarily have all the answers there, but it's going to create challenges for housing, transportation, education, all the new kids who are going to move in and go to school. These are issues that are going to have to be dealt with at the regional level. And a mayor, by the way, doesn't always have jurisdiction over the entire region, so they're going to have to work with county officials and others. It's going to be a challenging issue that we need to prepare for and other parts of government need to work with us. There's a lot of talk about supply chains. It's the cover of The Economist, pretty much every other issue. There's a lot of, I think, overhyping how quickly maybe this will work. But I do think watching trends in supply chain location and, and the rate and direction of those changes is going to be really interesting over the next decade. And it'll have a lot of implications for the United States of America and our partners and allies when you think about where supply chains are. So I've been watching that in semiconductors and other places. The last piece is totally wonky and playing to the hometown research crowd, but look, we need more research on this stuff. Like, when I talk to people about a modern American industrial strategy, like, their best discussion point is usually like something I learned in like 11th grade economics, the AP class, which is like picking winners and losers. Okay, I got it. Like, we heard the one-liner, we can have that debate, discussion, great, right? 
there's so much more to thinking about whether this stuff that I talked about is gonna work. We need like serious research and evaluation in terms of will the workforce piece work? Like not just announcing that we're gonna hire 5,000 people over here and then no one ever follows up. We need to know what kinds of training for what kinds of people on what kinds of pace, who gets a job, who moves to another job. Those are serious research questions. When you think about whether we're gonna be able to produce at scale and manufacture these chips, we're gonna need really grounded phenomenological research. Kathy is, like, is basically the world leader on this kind of stuff to understand whether we're gonna actually be able to produce these chips. And so for me, what I really hope with all this is like I, there's a lot of back and forth uh, in the econ profession about modern American industrial strategy, whether this is something that won't work, will work. To me, I do hope, regardless of all that, that there's serious research around these wave of investments so we can figure out better answers to all this. Because I do think whether it's national security or climate change, there's gonna be an imperative to think about these questions and develop some response and some strategy. This is one. So I will stop there, Mark, and uh, hopefully hit most of the stuff that I'm supposed to and do some Q&A. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Right. That was great. <clears throat> so on the workforce issue, I remember yeah. uh, 30 years ago, plus, I guess 30 plus years ago, when I was an undergraduate at MIT, by far the biggest major at MIT was electrical engineering. Yes. Nothing else was even close. In fact, I was in a major called Core 6, EECS, probably five times more in electrical engineering than computer science. And now, the people in Core 6, the electrical engineers, lament that it's flipped. But basically, it's now five to one CS to electrical yes. engineering. So it's my first question for you on the workforce is yes. when you think about workforce, do you have in mind these policies might influence you know, how many people go into engineering? And electrical engineering is a major here at Stanford. It's not, it's not nearly as big as computer science, <laughs> that's for sure, but can you talk a little when bit I, about When that? I told the kids there about this, they said, well, computers hadn't been invented when you were in college yet, so that's why. Uh, right. No, but, but you're right. Like, part of this is a story about where talent goes in the US economy. There's been some really interesting work about this, how people respond to incentives. So what are the Stanford graduates of this year going to do? Some of them will pursue their passion, some will go to med school no matter what, some will go to law school no matter what. But a lot are gonna be in this middle ground that they're gonna follow what the crowd's doing. And the crowd's gonna follow what's hot, what's sexy. And part of that will have to do with compensation, part of that will have to do with what they read in the media. And for a long time, like this sort of software-hardware distinction, which I know is not perfect, and I apologize, I, obviously semiconductors involves a lot of software, but software hardware or tough tech versus software distinction has sort of put many more people going on the software side. And I think the trend you saw from MIT today is played out across so many different schools. I'll even say at Duke, where I think for a long time the most popular major had been econ, now it's computer science. So that shift is happening not just within, but, but across. Here's what I think. I mean, we need to be basically sending signals to people that this industry has great opportunities, that's an interesting place to build a career, and I think awareness is the first step in any of this. And I think the companies are already starting to realize that. And to some extent, when I spoke at Berkeley today, there was some you know, small sample data set kind of thing that, hey, we're starting to see more interest because of things like this. Once you get the awareness, then you have to have a career path, right? I think people would go into some of these traditional industries because they understand what a software engineer does. They understand how she could move up in a company and what the role she might have and what the startup opportunities might be. We need to be able to build that on this side. I do think graduate students are different in the sense they might follow where the funding is for opportunities for R&D, for example, for their advisors, and so that's a key element that you can affect the rate and direction of, of people's te technological change, people's decisions. So I think it's gonna take those things and it's gonna take a while to see these kind of changes because it's also gonna be incumbent on the companies who are major in this, who, you know, who necessarily wouldn't necessarily be among the sexiest employers for someone coming out of Stanford today, but certainly were, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, you tell me, um, to, to up their game and make sure that they're attracting employers now. And that, that's, that's gonna take a big change on their front. I'm optimistic though that people respond to market incentives, and I'm optimistic that the chipset is creating a big push in this direction. And so I feel like some of that work we'll have to do deliberately and others of it was gonna happen um, naturally. Great, um, okay, so we worked a little bit, we overlapped a little bit on implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Yes. And one thing that I liked about that act was that we could think ahead of time, what are we trying to achieve and how are we gonna measure if this is successful? Yes. So in the case of Affordable Care Act, it was what share of people have health insurance or without health insurance, and what is the growth rate in healthcare costs? So when we're, if I had you back here in five, whatever the right time yeah. period is to look back and see how did the CHIPS Act do? Yes. What should we think of as like indicators? Where, did, where does the administration hate, hope to move the needle. 
and yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, uh, and I think with the Affordable Care Act, just to take your example further, it allows people now, when we're debating about the future of healthcare policy, to look back and say, hey, we did these things, and you know, here's what we achieved. Right? The number of people without insurance dramatically fell. Right. And so when people are talking about, should we repeal, should we do this, should we do that, you have these numbers that you know, generally people can point to. Healthcare costs, though, right? some of those issues, if I'm not wrong, like there's some issues of, oh, these interventions we were trying, like actually some of them worked better than others, and here's what we learned for the future. And so I'm hoping at a broad level that people can both understand, did all this stuff I just talked about, did it work? Obviously, I'm very vested in it, and I want it to work, but I do want like an honest accounting of whether it worked or not so we can have better policy. And I also think parts of it may work, and parts of it might not work. Right? And so we need to understand those pieces and the root causes. For us, if you think about 10 years from now, if we're successful, you should see the presence of leading edge production of semiconductor chips in the United States, as well as a reliable source of legacy chips in the United States as well. I don't use specific market shares, because it's hard to think about those things in the future, but we should have a significant share in the United States. That's one thing. Second thing is we should be leading the world in research and development in the key areas of semiconductors by measured by patents, commercialization, researchers coming to the US, all those kinds of things. And the third thing is that the defense industrial base should have a reliable uh, supply of chips that relies on our partners and allies and um, that you know, we have them when we need them. Because in geopolitical complex, you've seen this with um, Russia's war in Ukraine, right? Leverage, leverage on sort of key inputs or key commodities or key goods can be used in these conflicts. And we have to make sure we're, we're ultimately very resilient on that. Those are the three things I would think about. Great, okay. Um, and I'm gonna ask a couple more questions than I, I mean, I have tons of questions, but I know there are a lot of people here that are more knowledgeable about the space than I am, so. And I want to open it up too, so I, I want to hear from <laughs> right, them. You be I'll clear. learn from the right. questions, you know. Right, um, so you, I know that you can't comment on some of the sort of international complicated issues yeah. with China and so forth, but can you talk a little bit about the extent to which some of the, how this does change things uh, with Definitely. respect to other countries. Yeah, and I, I know, and I know for some, the most interesting part is this part that's harder to talk about, but I'll, I'll say what I can say about it and what the part I'm working on. The first is, like, if you think about countries like Japan, the Netherlands, um, you know, uh, all the countries in the EU, when they come to the United States, they want to engage and talk about the CHIPS Act. And they have a couple, I think, points of interest that I can share. One is, they want to make sure that we're not thinking that we're gonna just do all this in the United States and cut out all these other countries in the supply chain. And I think that, um, the good news on the CHIPS Act, it's different across some other different areas of the industrial strategy. It's clear that the supply chain has to be distributed around the world, and the different countries will play different roles. And so, really, it's not gonna be easy. There's gonna be grumbling, there'll be you know, negative parts of it. We're gonna have to work together, right, to build the supply chain. And yes, we're gonna try to build more manufacturing in the US, full stop, but the supply chain is always necessarily gonna be global. So that's, that's one thing. Second thing is they wanna collaborate on R&D. Right? So they want to make sure that these R&D bets that we're pace, placing in our National Semiconductor Technology Center aren't redundant with what they're doing. And so that's, again, a complicated issue. How do I choose what you do versus I do? We, we also need like, better, like, actual better dialogues. Like, you know what the G7 is. You know what the G20 is. Right? We need things to talk. We need places to talk about this stuff where you have the experts. And those things don't always exist. So the R&D piece is also an area of a lot of collaboration. So I feel like when industrial strategy implies that we're gonna build all this stuff in America, it creates um, a challenging dialogue. But the fact in this industry, we're able, I think, to have a more productive one. I also think when you think about sort of the strategic rival between the US and China, right, and the issues around the export controls, for example, a lot of people are tracking, this is also a point of a lot of discussion. One that, you know, that work is handled by the National Security Council. That's one I can't double click on very much. But I would say that um, that is the other issue that comes up in these discussions quite a bit. Those are sort of the three, the three areas. So, so collaboration on R&D, how we might think about the incentives. Like you know, maybe you think of legacy fabs being built in some places and logic and others. However you want to talk about that. And then the issue around the export controls and what we do vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So those, those, are the, those are the key issues. The other thing I think is it, it's about talent more generally. I mean, innovation is a team sport and uh, talent is distributed all around the world. And that's the other issue we spend a lot of time talking about. Great. Okay, so my last question before I open it up is uh, the semiconductor industry, if you just sort of look at how companies, we won't name a specific yeah. companies, but how companies in that area have been doing yeah. in recent months or uh, it's not necessarily great, at least yeah. by, measured by things like market cap and sort of. Uh, where, what are these so measures talking about? Yeah. So just Prices, to play earnings, a little bit no, devil's advocate yeah. here, if, if chips is so great, why is it like, yep. it, for, for this industry, why yes. isn't it having uh, a bigger why isn't it showing up there? It's a very important question. So if you're following the semiconductor industry, you're, you're reading about these, for, for some companies, not all, but you're reading about these sort of financial results that aren't positive, right? And the market's not treating them positively. 
So a couple things. One is, so the chips ad, as you can see, is, is starting. So the money hasn't gone out yet. So in some sense, like, we will see what happens going forward. And I also think the measurement of success for the Chips Act, I, I specifically, when Mark asked me, hey, what do you, how should we judge you? I didn't talk about the stock prices of the companies or the market cap. In the end, it is about building this capacity in the United States as like a key focus. And I, obviously, companies are going to do that in their financial interest as well, supported by our strategic investments. I will also say that this industry, and people who work in this industry, I talked to a lot of you beforehand, it's been a very cyclical industry from the very beginning. And a lot of people were talking about this current downturn a year ago and saying it was going to happen. It doesn't change for me the rationale for why we're doing this. The, the fabs that are going to be built, the supply chain that's going to be filled out, the investments that are going to be made in things like critical minerals, gases, things that support the semiconductor supply chain, they're things that are going to take hold over many years. And so we could very well be in a different part of the cycle by the time these investments take hold. I'd also say one of the whole points of this modern American industrial strategy, the theory of the case is to invest countercyclically on these issues because a boom and bust cycle, for example, would lead to underinvestment, for example, in the US if left to its own devices. Same thing might go for climate, right? When you see the prices of key materials go up or down. So I would say, while well, I pay a lot of attention to the financial results, I don't think there are many, there are many arguments against what we're doing that are really credible, but that to me isn't one of them because it's not about the short-term prices of the stocks. Great. Okay. Terrific. Okay. I'm gonna ask for questions from the audience. Uh, we have one right here, I think. Thing. Can we get the, Don, can we get the microphone to him just so? I'll try to speak up. So it would certainly seem that one of the goals would be national security and uh, manufacturing uh, supply chain continuity. Mm -hmm. And 10 years from now, you look back and say, hey, did all of this um, withholding of chips from China accelerate an invasion of Taiwan? That would not be good. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if 10 years from now, Taiwan were invasion, invaded or taken over somewhere in the interim, would we be held hostage or would we be able to mitigate that to maintain a more rules-based world order? And I would think those would be the paramount goals of all this. In 10 years, you'd look back and say either it sort of worked or it would have been a lot worse or maybe it didn't make that huge an impact because it's hard to impact China. Yeah, I mean, look, this is, this is the part of the piece I can't say too much about, honestly. I appreciate your comment. I do think, though, just but on like a very serious note, too, I think there's more than just one country here when it comes to supply chain resilience for us. You're right, the chip stuff centers on the relationship you're talking about. And, uh, but our, our rationale for doing it and supply chain resilience is broader than just one strategic relationship. There are other reasons we want to do this. If you think about what's going on in Europe, there's, there's other examples for supply chain resilience and resiliency. I think the question you're focused on, though, is very much in the mind of people and, and you know, shapes why a lot of people support the act and have thoughts about it. Yeah, yeah David. Hey, David. <laughs> hey, Ronnie. Um, so as you know, I was on the Intel board for I do. 29 years. Who put this guy in the front row? <laughs> and um, I hate to say this, but I've become increasingly skeptical of Intel's ability to execute. Yep. So if Intel is unable to, to actually build a successful foundry business and is unable to get yeah. back to leading edge nodes, yeah. can the CHIP Act succeed? Because they are such a, a substantial part <laughs> of what the CHIP Act is trying to actually build. Yeah, look, two for two right now. Card uh, question, specific uh, companies. Uh, specific companies. No, no, it, like, yeah, so I'll do the best I can. Because again, and I apologize, I told Mark beforehand, we said it, it's hard for me to comment on the I told very- you would get asked about I know, that's, and these are great questions. I just, <laughs> national security and then specific companies are, are hard in this position. I've definitely heard before what you're saying. It's definitely something that people are thinking about. I do think there's a variety of companies that can build fabs in the United States of America. It's already happening. In terms of who can build a leading edge and at what scale, these are open questions. Um, I think seeing the TSMC investment in Arizona, for example, um, is an important sign of sort of the broader resilience of this system to do things in the United States. Intel, because there's a small number of companies, I mean, this is like, this is the hard thing about industrial strategy in this industry, it's very concentrated. So Intel, just be one of just a handful of firms that can build up the leading edge potentially. And if they're successful in their five nodes in four years, right, that's, that's the mission. Um, they're going to be a critical part. So the success of the, all, this, all these handful of companies is critical to the CHIPS Act, which makes the degree of difficulty high. And, and I agree with you. Yeah. And it's an interesting perspective we can talk about offline, too. I'd like to hear it. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Thanks for the right, question. Right here. Hi. Hi. Um, so you mentioned earlier in your talk about PPE. Um, I mean, I remember delivering PPE all around the Bay Area, like yeah. 2020. I'm curious. What do you feel the CHIPS Act can teach you know, other industrial policy 
how do we apply the rules for semiconductors to reshoring more manufacturing? Yep, it's a, it's a really great question. I, I think a lot about it in the area that you mentioned, like medical products, for example, like generic drugs and APIs, like the ingredients for, for pharmaceuticals. And, and I'm thinking about so the materials that go into electric vehicle chargers, where those are produced. I think one thing to think about is, and this relates actually to David Yaffe's point, what is the capacity of domestic manufacturers to deliver? Is there a cost disadvantage? Is it a capability? Is it a process innovation disadvantage? Diagnosing which one that is is really important as a start because it could be that certain kinds of incentives or industrial policies could benefit, send a demand signal, let's say, right, um, make procurement easier to make domestic suppliers stand up and fill the need that you're talking about. In other areas, specifically ones that have been hollowed out for like a long, long time or never existed or are new, it might be harder to use those mechanisms and you might need to think more creatively and in the meantime, have other sources of supply while the domestic industry is being built up. And you need to think as the domestic industry is being built up, what a time frame is as you ratchet, right? Because as you know, in policy, you can just say, well, forever we're gonna have waivers and loopholes, right? But if you really wanna build that base in the United States, you need to think about sort of the long-term plan to get there with the talent and the technology and the firms. So that's at least what I've been thinking about in the CHIPS Act and it's what I would think about in some of these other areas. Some of the other areas you mentioned, like they differ in terms of the capital cost required to build manufacturing plants. They differ in the share of labor as a cost of overall production. They differ in the uses of things like automation. So there's also structural differences in the industries that I pay a lot of attention to when thinking about which policy lever we, we might pull. Um, and this is something that the US government hasn't done a lot of recently, right? So I do think there's a capability issue internally and working with folks across Commerce Department, Defense Department, HHS, all the departments to think through like what is our toolkit in this space? One thing I learned during the pandemic, I think, is that we have a lot more tools in the federal government to deal with demand than we do supply, right? It seems obvious, but like, you know, a lot of our government work is about sort of priming the pump and stimulus and recovery from recessions. But the supply side challenges, which are arguably, you know, as important and really need to get right, we don't have as many tools in the federal government to do that. And so that is like the overarching question I'm thinking about with regards to the, the work you did on PPE and the, the attendant issues. Okay, we've got a lot of questions, okay. but not a lot. I can of try to take. Let me a, say, like, go to Chris. Let, let me, yeah, let's just try to get a few questions. So Chris uh, and I, I, aggregate them, and I'll just ignore the hard ones. And I talk fast, almost as fast as you do. So I'll go. I'll go quickly here. So um, thinking about the people side of this, so the the, the economy is already at an all time low on employment, and we see the demographics of the boomers retiring in the engineering field coming up. What about not just the next generation, but the generation behind that? What investments do we need to do with maybe populations that aren't? naturally going towards these fields, and is that a part of the CHIPS Act? Good. You, you want to take Chuck, up? Yeah. you want to go, Ch Chuck, and then back? And then. Hey, Chuck. All right, I think, thanks for your talk. My question is, I know you probably can't say much about the competition with China, but I'm just looking at the high-level numbers, and they've, they've announced about $143 billion in subsidies for the semiconductor industry there. And so how should we think about that? Are, are we just at a lower scale? Is, is our innovation system more efficient? Are we getting more private industry response? How should we think about this difference in the scale of subsidies? Excellent. Right here. Yeah. Yep. Behind you, Chris. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can we get him a, a microphone? You're going to try to do this in like a minute, right? Yeah. A minute. Okay. Yeah. So, Mark knows uh, I was in the semiconductor business, yeah. worked for Morris Chang and Andy Grove for over 25 years, and was asked to consummate many of the things that the CHIP Act is asking for. Hmm. I can tell you. They were a dismal and complete failure. You, you can't build a business around building factories and then trying to find customers. And TSMC, and I worked for Morris Chang for almost 10 years, TSMC has a completely different culture of supplying products to other customers who, who then buy uh, custom semiconductors. Intel has never done any of that well. I tried to start foundry businesses for Intel twice. They both <laughs> failed miserably. And, you know, the other thing that's not going to work is Biden's plan to prevent China from advancing in this industry. We can see from what's happening in Russia with the Iranians, uh, you know, there's, the supply of semiconductor chips uh, that are necessary to build the bulk of industry capacity 
is too commoditized and hundreds and hundreds of people manufacture them. So those two things are not going to work. Intel is never going to be a big foundry supplier, and uh, the U.S. is not going to stop the Chinese from, you know. Now, if you, if you take those two assumptions as correct, what does that mean? The chin <laughs> okay, so good luck. You have about a minute. <laughs> That's the voice in my head. We have a minute to respond to Okay, all this let me do a quick thing. They're all great questions. On the, on the workforce piece, particularly for communities that have not been traditionally in this industry, um, and think about it, a lot of the Biden administration policies are thinking about how to create opportunities for women, people of color who traditionally haven't had these opportunities in the market. Manufacturing is typically a place that has not had a lot of women, right? And so how do we get more people interested in manufacturing? The companies have already started to make some efforts in this regard. I'm watching really closely those community college enrollments to make sure that we are seeing people from a wide spectrum of the community in those programs. But honestly, at the end of the day, it's going to be people like you on the outside and others who are making sure that those programs work and people know about them and they're actually on ramps to jobs. It is a big priority. But when you think about diversifying a workforce or reaching new people, it's actually going to be the companies that are going to be doing a lot of that work. Um, and we're definitely sort of pushing in that direction because it's important. And it's hard to do. As hard as the things this gentleman said to do, um, which, are, which are really hard, um, this is also really hard. Right? And, uh, and it's easy to say, let's have a more diverse workforce. But actually getting it done and doing it in an you know, evidence-based way, very difficult. We need a much better system for measurement and evaluation. But I can say more about that offline. Chuck's question, I mean, you're right, Chuck. A lot of, com a lot of countries are doing subsidy programs to support chips at the same time. There's a big risk of having an Amazon HQ2 race to the bottom. And so again, those international institutions where we're talking with our partners and allies and dialogues need to make sure that we're not doing that because it's going to raise the price of everything. E even if the assumptions he's talking about are right, you definitely don't want to be paying more than you have to. And so that's something I think about a lot. I do think, though, if you look at the big fund and some other things that Chinese have done recently, um, they haven't been as successful. And they haven't caught up to TSMC. And so that, while well, the voice in my head and his two assumptions are are really important and well-founded. You were involved in IFS. I understand Intel's trying to do a similar thing. I think that's one of the reasons that these incentives are open to all companies, not just ones worked here in the US. And it's one of the reasons I think that you know, TSMC, Samsung, and others building here is really, really important to get a diversity of companies. The degree of difficulty is high for the reasons that David said and yours. So I appreciate it. Uh, I won't be able to answer those questions for a while, but hopefully I'm right and you're wrong for the sake of America. Okay, well, with that, on that uplifting note, yeah. uh, we're going to wrap. So thank you again to Ronnie Chatterton. <laughs> thank you. Seven p.m. Warriors tickets, so I'm getting out of here. So anyway, no good to see you. Ronnie. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let me take.